It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by EmailRevealer.com. Uh, if you go to the website EmailRevealer.com, let's say you think your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend's cheating on you. Uh, you send in your email address, and they could trace it back to online dating websites and catch them cheating online. Um, did you know that 30% of the people that are using online dating websites are either married or dating someone, they're in a committed relationship, and they're still on there uh, cheating online. So send in your email address to emailrevealer.com. They'll trace it back to online dating websites and catch them cheating online. Okay. I've been trying to get this guest for a couple of years now. Okay. We, our guest today is Samantha Spiegel. She's an artist, a model, like a fashion designer. Uh, she's living up there in the Bay Area. And the reason why uh, we want to get a hold of Samantha Spiegel is she used to date John Mark Carr. Uh, John Mark Carr, you might remember, he was the guy who confessed to murdering John Benet Ramsey. Uh, fascinating character, this John Mark Carr. He was off in Thailand, I believe, getting a sex change operation. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Samantha Spiegel, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much. Samantha, before we get started, uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Samantha Spiegel? Well, I'm kind of going on this kind of uh, spiritual journey right now to figure that out, but um. I'm just a very eccentric but lovable um, kind of uh, legend in San Francisco and uh, just an artist. And um, I have some plans uh, ahead of me. I want to just really be a patron of the arts and uh, stuff like that. But um, I'm just I'm just trying to become healthier and happier. And um, I mean... I love opera. I love silent films. I, I I love records. I love Cole Porter. I mean, I don't know. I just I'm kind of an old soul, so I'm not your typical 26 year old. That's for sure. And, and what about modeling? Do you do any modeling? I um, haven't done it in a little while because, um, well, about two and a half years ago, I had two pregnancies, unexpected pregnancies, with the person I was dating. So I did gain some weight, but I've been exercising. So it's been a while, but I was thinking about getting back into it, doing like plus size modeling, since there's now more of a, a market for that and it's more accepted. Uh, not quite as much as it should be, but um, yeah, I'd get back into modeling. So we definitely got to I mean, talk. I'm, I'm I've been doing this thing. It's called the Daniel Fast, right? Uh, it's a fast. What? It's called. I've been doing this thing. It's called the Daniel Fast. It's it's from okay. the Bible, okay? So, you know, so it's a very old fast, okay, like six thousand years old, <laughs> and you go twenty one oh. twenty one days, no sugar, no coffee, no alcohol, no meat, no bread, no, no rice, no coffee, no. But you feel great. Well, I tried something similar to that. I I'm on the ketogenic diet right now. It's like high protein, low carb, no sugar. Oh, yeah, no sugar. Yeah, you got to cut sugar out. That's it's so bad for you. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a 21-day fast. I've been doing it now for 67 days. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, I feel great. <laughs> I, lo I lost about 40 pounds. This morning I went out bike what? riding. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Congratulations, Ed. Yeah, no, yeah. I feel really, really good. I, I, today I went hiking and bike riding and, uh, today before I get up at like uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now. Let's get down to it. Now, uh, somehow, you came into contact with John Mark Carr. How old were you when you met John Mark Carr? Nine. He no. was the teacher's aide for the grade, for the third grade. I was in fourth grade, and uh, he was known as Mr. Carr, but he was a teacher's aide. A lot of, that's the thing, a lot of journalists got this wrong. They said that he was my teacher, which he wasn't. But the third grade and the fourth grade had recess in the Cortelia at Convent of the Sacred Heart together. So I got to know him very well. And actually, one of my old best friends from school, uh, who I won't name, but she was actually mentioned in his manuscript. She was obsessed with her because she was blonde and blue-eyed, and uh, she didn't look 
like John Bonet, but she was just blonde and blue eyed. So he actually like stalked her in Paris when she was traveling there with her dad, and he saw her. It's just crazy. But um, no, he was a teacher's aide. So Mr. Carr, that was nine. Okay, now what year was that? 2001. That was the year that um, shortly after he got hired for being a teacher's aide, he was um, he was arrested for the child pornography in Petaluma. Okay, now what, what state was that in? California, San Francisco. Cal- okay, so in California, San Francisco, 2001, he was your teacher's aide or a teacher's aide at your school. Yes. And now when you had this kind of relationship with John Carr at that time, uh, did he treat you like an adult or did he treat you like a child? What, what was the what was the interaction between you? Um, I would say it was a mixture, but I he 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 treated me like I uh, I'll say this. I think he thinks that children are very disenfranchised, and he's said that before. Um, so it was more like an adult, but you know, still with some aspects of being a child. But he was. He was actually it's kind of scary to say this, but he was really good with kids, even though he was still creepy. Like he, he has that creep factor, but yeah. he's very funny personations. I mean, if you ever get a chance to talk to him or her, whatever he's doing now, um, you should ask him to do some uh, South Park impersonations or um, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And that's a very good one. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, you said there was a creepy factor even back then when he was a teacher's aide. Yes. And you noticed this um, as a child. So, what? You noticed this as a child? Yes, I did. Okay. But I was still attracted to him in spite of that. So you had a nine-year-old crush on him? Yeah. Okay. I mean, when I was in preschool, I had a crush on like a 35-year-old uh, teacher in my preschool, so... I've just always liked older men. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I think I've the so. Now, when, when you were interacting with John Marcar at nine years old, was this only at the school or was this also outside of the school? It was just at the school. I think he was being very, very careful because he was doing, um, you know, the child pornography thing at the time. But um, I will say this. When I was when I was Facebook friends with his son, Seven Exodus, and John Marcar Jr., and... Uh, Damon, uh, Seven told me that he would bring him, he was like grooming him to become a pedophile. He would take him to my school uh, when he wasn't working to watch the students, the girls play in the front um, play area on Broadway Street, and he would take pictures of them. So I found that out, and I thought that was just, you know, creepy. So even today, you're... St- after, the, after the fact. But today you're still in touch with John Marcar's sons? Well, no, no, no. They blocked me a long time ago after okay. the news broke out in 2010. So now, you, when when he was your teacher, then, so then what happened? Then he got arrested and he was no longer at the school? Yes. Now, this is way before, or did, when did it come in that he confessed to the John Benet Ramsey murder? That was the uh, summer 2006. He actually okay. came with, I think it was NBC in a limo to our school. I remember this. I was... I was in ninth grade, and we're all like, oh, my God, John Mark Carr is outside in a limo. And he tried getting into the school to show these NBC guys where he had once worked because he had this he had this weird fascination and obsession with Convent of the Sacred Heart because it's a finishing school. It's a very fancy, prestigious school that a lot of famous people have gone to. So the school actually got a restraining order against him. And uh, so I did not know, though, that I would be the next one to get a restraining order against him. Well, let me ask you this. If he had a, a child porn conviction, wasn't there already some kind of pro- prohibit, 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 wasn't he prohibited <laughs> from visiting a preschool with a child porn conviction? Well, I'll say two things. I think Convent of the Sacred Heart, while it has very good academics, I think it's run by a bunch of morons and um, people that don't know how to do their jobs. Um, they obviously didn't do a background check on him. Or, um, But here's the thing is, you know, his whole life he's been doing nanny jobs and tutoring jobs all over in like Costa Rica and France and all this. So he has like, he had really like uh, wealthy uh, clients and yeah. students and people that he would take care of. So it's, I don't, he's truly like one of the most elusive like criminals that I have ever encountered. 
And, and how is he financing yeah. all this with, with just small, petty jobs, like nannying jobs and stuff like that? Yes, but I also think um, by the time I reconnected with him in 2007, uh, 2006, 2007, was that he was living with um, his father who just died. I found out uh, he died like a year and a half ago, I think, but at uh, Wexford. Wex. So he would uh, live with him and his dad would pay him like five or eight bucks an hour to do menial jobs around um, his what John would call his Victorian home in outside of Atlanta. But it was really one of those Sears Roebuck like build your own homes, like craftsman homes, you right. know. But uh, yeah, and he would complain a lot about that. He, we, we would be on the phone and he'd be talking shit about his dad and talking about how he's so much better than doing menial jobs around the house. So there was some bitterness about that. Now, my understanding is that when he got arrested there in 2001, they allowed him to continue working at the school? Uh, no. They, since he was arrested, he had to leave. I don't know if the school was aware of that until the police like informed them, but um, I'm not really sure what happened. But Because um, my story with him kind of starts more uh, in the mid to late 2000 so okay then how did you um reconnect with him i guess it was 2006 2007 how did you reconnect with him back then yeah well i was watching the news and i saw that he was on tv and i'm like holy shit and you know i think this whole jean benet ramsey case has always been fascinating to the whole country and uh, i was certainly always fascinated by it um and uh, so it took me about a year and a half to build up the courage to contact him. At that time, he had this website with my friend, his ex, his ex girlfriend Brooke Simmons. Now Brooke Doe's gone, and it was called JohnMarkCardNow dot com. And uh, so I just sent a message, and uh, he responded immediately. And we started talking that night on the phone. And I was in the bathtub, and uh, we were talking. And he remembered me. Oh, and what was that about the bathtub? I missed that. <laughs> you were in the bathtub. Oh, yeah, you... the first, the day I sent him the email, I got a message back and I gave him my phone number. Right. And our first conversation was spent with me, like, naked in the bathtub and him on the phone just talking. And how old were you at that point? Um, 16. 16. Okay, so 16 years old, you call up John Mark Carr, you found him through his website. You're sitting in a bathtub, you start talking to him. Now, uh... Now, was this the because I know I saw something online about you contacting other serial killers and stuff like that. Was this the first time you mm -hmm. contacted anybody like that? Yes, was, John was the first. John was the first. Okay, now you know John was also a, a murder suspect in the death of a black, the murder of a black girl in Petaluma, like six blocks away from his home. No, I did not know that. Does anybody know about that? Yeah, so Dante was his second uh, murder suspect, like suspicion. And and what year was that? That that the murder of the uh, the black child? Uh, I think that was like oh my god, I can't even remember. That might be like mid to late nineties or early two thousands. I can't remember. And not what, much is said about, it, but it happened. And do you know the, the the circumstances of the death of that child? I do not. It's been a while. Okay, well, you knew it one time, but you forgot. Yeah. Okay. So now you're sitting in the bathtub, you're talking to John Mark Carr. What was the conversation like? Was it flirtatious? A bit flirtatious, yes. Um, it, I'll tell you this, like, the the relationship became kind of very incestuous to some degree um, as time went on because he was like a father figure and like a best friend and kind of a lover at the same time. I mean, over the phone and over texts and emails and stuff. And But uh, it, it became quite bizarre and kind of incestuous he played all these different roles for me so yeah, yeah. I, I could imagine i told you uh, we were chatting online before we started talking today and i told you that uh, when it when he popped on the news and the name john mark carr popped up in 2006 like you said when he confessed to john Bonnet ramsey at the time the news media wasn't very sophisticated about locating people online and on the internet and on message boards no. and stuff right and i found him on usenet and he had these very bizarre postings where he was, he said he had an organization, a child therapy counseling organization, you know, and he wanted to speak to troubled okay. teen girls, you know, and it was just, have you ever seen those posts? No, I haven't. You have to send that to me. 
He I, certainly found a troubled teen in me, though. Yeah, well, but even no, but he was looking for younger than you, though. He was looking for younger. Yeah. No, I was as as uh, my haters said, I was even too old to give him a boner. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, so you, you now you said he was like a father figure to you. Now, did this sort of progressing uh, over the telephone and online? You you establish a relationship with him. Text messages. Oh my God! I got. So many. I was on my phone all the time talking. I think he got the satisfaction out of a convent girl talking to a teacher that had been um, basically uh, ostracized from the academic community because of his criminal activity and was, you know, uh, had a restraining order against him. And uh, I think he just got off on the fact that we, I would be walking through these marble halls and you know this beautiful these beautiful mansions in a place where he used to work and um i basically gave up everyone for him i wasn't allowed to talk to any males i even if they were teachers even if they were my father my brother i couldn't talk to them because he wanted to be the only man in my life so then what would happen if your father and your brother wanted to talk to you what would you do I mean, let's get real, like, they, you know, at the time I lived with them, so I would talk to them, but, like, right. in front of John, like, it was, uh, I, I wouldn't do it, so I had to, I had some secrets from John, you know, I kept some secrets. Okay, well, not any longer, okay, <laughs> he's gonna, he's probably not listening to this longer. now. Okay, now, this is just incredible. Now, did the whole subject of his confession to the John Benet Ramsey murder come up in your discussion with him? I'm sure it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> okay. And I still wonder about what he, uh, well, you can ask your question, but uh, yeah, I've got some stuff to say about that. Okay. The first time in the tub it came up or, or afterwards? Afterwards, but very soon afterwards, shortly afterwards. Okay. Now after the, how long did the tub conversation last? Oh God, I have horrible memories from doing so many drugs. Uh, I would say it lasted about, my guess is probably like two hours. I can believe that. You're very talkative. We were talking off the air for about a half hour. <laughs> okay, just trying to get ready right. for the show. No, uh, so he's very talkative, too. Yeah, right. And when you get two talkative people, it's always a disaster. Nothing gets done. Now, yeah. So now, and then he, he, you talked to him for two hours, and then how soon the next day did he, he contact you again? That, I mean, I, I don't really remember because it was, you know, yeah, 10, 10 11 years ago. But, right. I mean, we started daily communications very quickly. The first thing we the the thing we talked about the most in that bathtub conversation was reminiscing about convent um, students that he remembered. He actually asked me to go get my yearbooks and um, take pictures of students that were in his class that he taught and send them and text him those pictures. Yep. Okay. And, and he would tell me he'd be like, "Oh, like her? Yeah, I remember her. Like this and that." And so he had a really good memory. And uh, there were times he would ask me to um, call up, like, the, my friend that was in his manuscript um, and so he could talk to her or call up um, a famous actor's son who I had been best friends with and uh, who uh, I'll just say that he committed suicide in 2014. But uh, he went to my school and his kids went to my school. And um, so he would actually, I was so, like, brainwashed by him even by then that I didn't get that having, you know, this person that is a known pedophile and murder suspect, like calling them and it, they were very awkward conversations. I didn't get it at the time, but I, I see it now. The conversations with the people he was asking you to call were awkward. Yes. What was he asking you to say to them? It, oh no. He just wanted to talk to them. I just, oh. I had their numbers. Oh my I'd God. Start okay. being like hey, whoever. And yeah. So, and what would he say to them? Um, he would just talk about 2001 and just what they're up to and and uh, tell them to take care of themselves and stuff. I mean, nothing, it wasn't anything, like, overtly creepy, but, I mean, the the whole thing in and of itself was kind of creepy. Yeah, well, looking back, it's, over, <laughs> it must, it's, like, it's very overtly creepy now, right? <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, you're 16 years old. Like, was... He just from 2001 calling me. Yeah, my daughter is, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, 17 now. So, you know, at 16, I can kind of imagine, you know, you don't have the same kind of world experience that you have now at 26. Yeah. Right. 
you know, so yeah. now when the topic comes up of John Benet Ramsey, what does he have to say to you? Well, what he would always ask me was he'd say, he'd say, he'd, um, <coughs> sorry, okay. he'd say, Samantha, do you think I did it? And I'd say, well, what do you want me to think? And he's like, I just want you to, I just want to know if you think I did it or not. And I'm so ambivalent about it. I didn't even know because I mean, he knew stuff, and I had a friend that died. Uh, she was in, with, she worked with the investigators, um, Ray Krogan. I have her ashes on my mantle, but um, she would give me like these secret tapes that she had recorded, and uh, like forty hours of tapes. And she said that he was still being investigated, uh, even after he was um, uh, uh, acquitted um, in two thousand and six. He was still being investigated by the FBI for Jean Benet. They thought that. There were two people there, and uh, it was just not him that left his calling card, you know, his DNA. Right. But uh, she, uh, what was the question again? Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, what, what did, first of all, this woman you're talking about with the ashes and stuff, you have, she has 40 hours of tape recordings with John Mark Carr? Oh, yeah, I can send that stuff all to you. I have some of it. Um, I also have, like... He's also very drunk in it too. He would get very drunk and start whining about Jean Benet and Brooke and 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 uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Oh yes, yeah, send me that. And now Brooke was your age. It was. <laughs> Brooke was what? your age. Brooke yeah. was your age. Yeah. Okay. The f and how did he know Brooke? She was in your class. No, Brooke was the girl he was dating. His quote unquote fiance when he was arrested and she had a she had a daughter at the time. I actually met her for the first time in two thousand thirteen and we're friends on Facebook but she like she doesn't want anything to do with any of this so I just we she doesn't like talking about it. Right. But I firmly believe that um John dated her because she had a young daughter that was I think at the time oh. she was four or three. And and do you think anything happened to that kid? Uh, no, actually, because I know Brooke says otherwise. I think she's, it's her pride and also a factor of embarrassment, but they actually didn't spend that much physical time together. That's what Ray told me, because they, she went out with, uh, uh, John and Brooke to Las Vegas and to Atlanta and stuff, and she said that in the entire time they were together, I think they only spent like two weeks together, but they make it seem like they spent more time together. And uh, Ray is who? Who is Ray? So Ray was um, when all this went down with John before uh, it went public. I, uh, Ray had taken a, he stopped paying for his John Mark Carr now website, so she took it over to keep him in the public eye. She called it a uh, I think it was still called John Mark Carr now, but it, she ran it until I contacted her, and so she was very hesitant about me. She thought I was kind of a nut at first, but then I I showed her everything, and so she believed me, and. Um, she was uh, she was kind of my fairy godmother. She actually helped me when I was, you know, 19. I went to the courthouse, um, filed a restraining order, and uh, she was just amazing. She guided me. We talked every day. She was like a mother to me. And then she died in 2012, about six months before my dad died. But um, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, that was hard. But, um, think, yeah. Now... When the we first started talking to John Mark Carr about the John Benet Ramsey murders, what did he have to say? He was still saying that he did it. He said that he did it, but then when he would get drunk, he would be offended if someone thought that he had done it. He would say, "Like, how could someone think I? How could someone think I could hurt such a beautiful child, such a precious, beautiful child?" And you know, the thing about whenever he talked about John Benet Ramsey, I was, you know, I'm like sixteen, seventeen. And he's going on about, and, you know, I had this weird kind of attraction to him for some reason. And I became jealous of a dead six-year-old because he talked about her so much and in a way that I wanted to be talked about, you know. Like, I felt like no one had talked about me that way before. So I became jealous of Jean Benet, and um, we often had fights about that. So that was kind of, um, that was a uh, difficult thing for us to get past. So even though he was tr he was attracted to you and he was trying to keep your attention, he was still obsessed with John Benet Ramsey. Yes, and Brooke. He would have um, he would use a, a what was it called stat counter, which he learned about from Ray, to track people's uh, activity on his website. And he'd he'd all of a sudden he'd be drunk and he'd say, "Oh, 
people are looking at my website from Las Vegas. You know, Brooke Simmons, she lives there. You know, she's probably in her office and everyone's laughing at me and talking about me. He's just really paranoid. So I, I even thought he was paranoid back then, but, you know, I just put up with it. So. Well, why'd you put up with it? You're a very pretty girl. What You didn't have other men or uh, boys attracted to you and giving you attention and stuff? Well, I wasn't sleeping with boys at the time. I was sleeping with men. I was, I was a lot of statutory rape going on, but uh, he just, I don't know, he gave me, like, the attention that I needed, and, I mean, he even told me to take, to take my uh, IUD out and, like, you know, not have sex and stuff, but, uh, I mean, he was very controlling. I, I don't know why he wanted to be the only man in my life, but that's the way he wanted it to be. Okay, so even though you were getting other male attention, you were still. What was it about John? You said he, before you said he was funny. And that that was it. Yeah, he was. Funny. <laughs> I love. I yeah. I'm I'm a bucket of giggles, so it it helped that he was very funny. But now uh, uh, physically, he's not very attractive looking. You you were able to overlook that. No, he's a monkey. Are you serious? He's a monkey. We oh, yeah. Ray and I would make fun of him all the time after everything came out. Uh, we uh yeah we'd make fun of him he had these these arms that were longer than usual than normal like people's arms and and uh, he just has these creepy eyes the thing you asked me about the creep factor that i could feel when i was even a child was it's in his eyes they're like dead creepy eyes and it almost looks like he wears eyeliner it's like he got like his eyes tattooed or something his eyeliner tattooed on but um no, it was just his eyes. They were dead, and you could just tell that there was something very dark inside him. But you know what? I was very. I'm. I'm still attracted to dark stuff. I'm just. I keep it at a healthy, at a healthy level right now. I don't like get involved with these people anymore. But I'm very fascinated by all of it. Yeah, unfortunately, I do have to get involved with a lot of these people. You know, I do have to meet them. And the, you're, you're damn right. They're creepy as hell, man. You know, there's a. <laughs> they are. <laughs> you know. It's, it's very. I got a lot of PTSD going on, man. I tell you now. <laughs> right. I, I, really. Well, you must too. You know. And you said you've been through therapy. For I all actually this. Yeah. had to. The cool thing. I had to go through deprogramming in therapy with a specialist to uh, to uh, basically pull myself out of this mind control brainwashing situation that I found myself in. You know, it's like when people talk about hypnotism, they're like, oh, like, I totally think I'm not susceptible to being hypnotized. I'm totally not that kind of person. Well, you don't think that you're the type of person to be taken advantage of and be put into a, a, a child sex cult and and um, all that. But you then all of a sudden you find yourself deep in it and you're just like, how did I get here? And, and then it's so hard to get out. You're just. Um, you're stuck. So it took me, I would say, I was officially cured of John after, let's see, by the time I was 23. It took a few years. It took a few years. That's only about three years ago. You're still in therapy now? Every every week. Okay. Yep. Sometimes I go to group therapy too, but... Yeah, actually, um, I did tell you, though, that I tried re reconciling with John, not like starting up a, another friendship with him because I don't want that. But on Facebook, I tried to uh, I tried to make amends and just, you know, say, like, I, I forgive you. And for anything I did, you know, not, none of this was supposed to go public. It was a journalist that found my the, the information on the, the public records in the court, right. um, the courthouse. But uh, it was supposed to be private, but uh, I just, you know, apologize. I'm like, I'm sorry we went, what happened happened. And uh, he just fucking blocked me. <laughs> but he, he still thinks I'm, you know, the worst thing to ever happen to him. He thinks I'm his enemy. But I told him that, you know, we went through a lot and that I still cared about him. But I just wanted us to, you know, say, say our peace and then just move on with our lives. And he just blocked me. Now, he's on Facebook under his regular name? Yeah. So I'm wondering because... What I maybe you can tell me about this because that uh, Rich she got the um, I think it was for uh, Inside Edition or t the Today Show or one of those shows I went on, but they got the actual court recordings of him changing his name the second time to Alexis Valor and Reich. So, I from what I understand is when you change your name legally, you change you have to like legally go by that name, you can't use your old name. So, it makes me wonder if you changed his name back to John Mark Carr because uh. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't know how that works out. But uh, yeah, if somebody reported it, Carter, if someone reported it to yeah, if someone reported it to Facebook saying that's not his real name, they would contact him. He would have to send a, a scan of his driver's license. 
So he might have an old yeah. license or something. He, you know, there's, there's ways to get around that. Okay, yeah. let, let's take a little commercial break, okay? We're here okay. with uh, Samantha Spiegel. Fascinating stuff. She was the girlfriend of John Mark Carr. He tried to recruit her into a sex cult to, to lure little children. And he wanted a, a little harem of little six and seven year old girls. Am I right? Yeah. Even down to like four or three. The thing Diane Diamond got wrong was that uh, they weren't Jean Bonnet lookalikes. He actually typically liked brown hair, brown eyes. He liked a lot of uh, Central American girls. So it's not, it's just Jean Bonnet Ramsey that he's obsessed with. It's not. So Diane Diamond said that he was uh, trying to create a Jean Bonnet lookalike cult, but that was uh, not not true. Okay. All right. Let's take a little commercial break. We're here with the Samantha Spiegel. We'll be right back after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. Archival Revival, the Christian Film Archive, is currently paying for vintage Christian films. Uh, they are dedicated to preserving and restoring classic Christian films and media. So if you have an original prints, negatives, or other film elements of classic Christian films, or you have audio recording masters for classic Christian record albums, they want to buy them from you. So email archival.revival at gmail.com, and they're going to make you an offer. Archival Revival wants to preserve these classic Christian films so that they continue saving people for years. These films have brought people to salvation. They want to continue that. Their staff has decades of experience in handling and preserving of film elements, and they utilize the very best climate-controlled film storage facilities around the world. Contact them today at archival.revival at gmail.com. If there's someone you know has these prints, negatives, recording masters, or other materials from vintage Christian films, you can check out their blog at archivalrevival.blogspot.com. Now, just so you understand, Archival Revival wants to pay you for these films. So you can look in, in your church attic, in the church basement. Uh, if you have a, a friend who runs a, a Christian youth uh, ministry uh, or uh, these youth uh, vaca vacation Bible study camps, you know, uh, they have these old films in those big metal containers, 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter. Archival Revival wants to buy them from you. So this is a sponsor that actually wants to give you money. And all you have to do is contact them, tell them what you have. If you're in the U.K. or Ireland or Africa, uh, these films are all over the world, and they're gathering dust, and they're going to deteriorate if they don't get into the hands of Archival Revival. So that's archival.revival at gmail.com, or the blog spot is archivalrevival.blogspot.com. Don't forget, this show is brought to you by PSCoco.com. Phoebe Saad is an independent curator with the Cocoa Exchange. Uh, the Cocoa Exchange is formerly known as Dove Chocolate Discoveries, and they make the finest silky smooth chocolate because the products start with the best cocoa beans, which are tested for quality and flavor by expert technicians. The Cocoa Exchange offers not just premium chocolates, but anything from sauces and spices to brownie and cake mixes and even coffee and martini mixes. If you wish to treat yourself or someone you love to a sweet and tasty gift, then the Cocoa Exchange is the brand for you. So you go to PSCocoa.com, you click on the Shop Now button, you can see all their beautiful chocolates, you can order it right now tonight, it could be in your, your mailbox in a couple of days, or if you want to get into the chocolate, chocolate business, you want to be a, a chocolatier just like Phoebe Saad, uh, you can uh, click the Contact Us button, and you can learn how to get your own website, go into the Cocoa Chocolate Business, and uh, sell chocolate and make a little bit of money there. Remember, all these shows on Awake are brought to you by EmailRevealer.com. You can go to EmailRevealer.com and get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. Uh, but you also do all the kind of different services for you, an, an online dating service investigation. It's called an online infidelity investigation. And that's where you give us your husband or your boyfriend, your girlfriend's email address, and we trace it back to their online dating websites, and we return a list of all the dating sites that that email is registered to. We can expand on that investigation and uh, trace it back to porn sites, escort service sites, swinger sites, uh, even um, uh, gambling websites, and even prescription drug websites. If you think your ex-husband or something is addicted to prescription medication or uh, involved in an extreme uh, online pornography addiction, 
Uh, we can produce a, a report for you that you can use in court. Adoption investigations. If you want to locate your birth parents or your, or your birth child you gave away for adoption, we can do, do adoption investigations for you. Asset searches for you. Locate bank accounts, uh, hidden uh, uh, assets, hidden properties, uh, hidden income, all different kinds of services in the asset search investigation. Email tracing. If you need to locate or identify somebody from just an email address, we can uh, uh, do an email trace investigation for you. And all kinds of digital forensics, computer and cell phone, uh, digital forensics, where we can uh, recover deleted content from an email or a hard drive and produce a report for you that you can use in court. That's emailrevealer.com, or you can contact me at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. We're here with Samantha Spiegel uh, calling us from the Bay Area. She's an artist up there, and uh, she's telling us about her experience with uh, John Mark Carr, uh, the suspected, well, not the, the confessed uh, the killer of John Benet Ramsey. Now, now, when he was telling you about uh, John Benet, that he murdered John Benet Ramsey, a couple of questions. What, mm -hmm. Now, First, did he say what he was doing up there in Boulder, how he got into the house, what he did in the house? Um, I, I think if I remember correctly, he said that he knew, like, the Ramsey's gardener or something, but uh, he was up there. I don't, he never really said what he was there for, but he did say that he knew the gardener. And uh, the other thing is that um, I wanted to tell you about his uh, second wife, um, what's her name, uh, uh, Brooke? Laura Knutson, the one that he has three kids with. Right. She's always been very odd. Like, um, I was friends with his first wife, the one that he, uh, he fudged the, her age on the uh, marriage certificate that she was 13 when she was actually 12 and then all that. Anyway, so I'm friends with her, but his second wife has always been really protective of him. And Ray and all the investigators thought that was highly bizarre. So, um, no, she actually, I think she was questioned about where he was on December 25th, 1996. Um, and she always claimed that he was home, but that I think there was no proof that he was home. She never actually showed proof. She just claimed that he was home. Uh, but he could have very well been in Boulder. I don't know. Now, did he give you a reason why he would be in Boulder? Just could, did, did he know about John Bonet before she was killed? Um, I, he, I don't think I ever asked him. Okay. That's interesting. I don't, I don't think I ever asked him. Yeah, because if he was so, so fascinated with little girls, maybe he was following the, uh, and he was an internet guy. He was savvy on the internet. If he was on Usenet, he yeah. knew what he was doing. So he would know what these websites were. Well, you know, were. they say that John Ramsey, some conspiracy theorists claim that John Ramsey got in, involved with the child sex trafficking, like in Amsterdam and Bangkok and stuff, his job and all this seedy stuff. So I don't know about that. I am not familiar with the Ramseys, but, um, I mean, if that was the case, then maybe, you know, John, you know, found out about some underground thing in Boulder. i Boulder is a very odd place. You know, like the airport yeah. is very, uh, creepy. Or is that Denver? Denver. I can't remember. Yeah, Denver. Denver. Okay. But yeah, I, I did hear that there's, um, that uh, that John Ramsey would travel a lot to a lot of places that have that had child sex trafficking and child pornography. So I don't know. Yeah, Stephen Singular wrote wrote a he, he, he's from Colorado and he's written some great. I books. know that guy. You you met him. You know him. Yeah. Okay, because his theory is that there's a child porn angle and all that. Yeah. Now, yeah. now let me ask you a question. Now, uh, has the FBI ever interviewed or the Boulder Police interviewed you about what you know about Carr? No, I mean not Boulder PD, but I did talk to the FBI. I contacted the FBI after John started threatening to kill me uh, numerous times, and um, they didn't take me seriously. Um, even the police didn't take me seriously, but the judge did. So that's all that matters. Right. Well, you called your local San yeah. Francisco police. I did. I, I called them several times. They didn't even take down reports like they're supposed to. And what'd you like, tell them? Like protocol. Uh, I told them. Oh God, this was uh, this was when I got back from rehab. So this was when I was like nineteen. But uh, I told them. I showed them everything, and they just like didn't care. They just thought, Oh, John Mark Carr, he's a nut. And when you called the FBI, they told you to contact the local police. 
they made an appointment with me at my parents' house, and I waited for them, and they never showed up. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Now, so, okay, now you, you're starting this relationship with John Marcar. It, did it, it, it became a physical, intimate relationship? No, but at, um, at one point, I was sending him, like, $300 boxes of Godiva chocolate in, when he was living with his dad, and uh, uh, I wanted to buy a plane ticket to uh, uh, Sandy Springs, or what, what, the suburb that he lived in, what was it called? Yeah, Sandy Springs. And I uh, almost did, but then I got sent away to rehab. Uh, John Mark Carr was the last straw for my parents. Um, here's something that I don't think many people know, is that John, you know, he always wanted to talk to Patsy, you know, before she died, even though he hated her. Let me, I'll be honest, he hated her. The, the whole wanting to talk to her thing was just some facade, like, I don't, just some sick thing to talk to, you know, John Bunny's mother, but with me... He also wanted to talk to my mom. My mom always refused to talk to him. And I would tell my mom, you know, if you care about me, you're going to talk to anyone that is my friend. And she'd say, no, no, no. And she just refused to. But he he wanted to talk to her so badly. And I never really understood why. Your, your parents never for, forbid you from, from talking to Mark, John McCarr, even at 16, 17 years old? They never well, told you? It wasn't a secret. It was more, um, I mean, they... My parents were older. They were, they were, you know, born during the Depression. And uh, they just kind of have a turn the other, turn the other, not turn the other cheek, but like look the other way kind of, right. you know, take on things. So, um, and that's one of the things that I'm still kind of, you know, sour about or salty about now is that my mom didn't, I don't think she really protected me. But I think I was so rebellious at the time that I would have found a way to, to do it anyways, but I mean, especially with all the statutory rape that happened when I was underage with these older men, I think that, uh, you know, the police would always ask me, do you want to press charges? Well, I don't even think it's my choice. I think if it's statutory rape, they do it. But I always ask my mom, you know, as I got older, like, why didn't you call the police on these guys? It was like 15 having sex with like 45 year olds. Like, why, why didn't you call the police? So that's a definitely a sore spot for between my mother and I. Uh, even today, um, because I just don't feel she protected me well enough. Yeah, yeah. How were these men getting access to you? Uh, just literally, like going out. They just, I was a cute girl. They just, you know, and I guess they, I don't know. And some of them I still talk to, but like we don't do anything. But I, I think they're all kind of creepy now, and uh, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about um? There, there came a time with John Marcar that he want, he started to tell you about this idea that he wanted like a harem of, of little girls. How did that come about? Um, how did that come about? That uh, I can't remember exactly how it came about, but it's not like he was you know shy about it. I think at that point we were so close and we were talking so much that um. I think he just brought it up, and I was so far gone mentally that I was just like, okay, well, anything to make you happy. You know, I'm not a pedophile, but he was, and I thought, you know, I, in my mind at the time when I was like 17 or 19, I thought that I, that, you know, it was like, he, the way he presented it to me was just like a family. Like, he he, he modeled it after the Manson family, hmm. which is why hmm. later I, I wrote you Charles Manson and, and Patricia Quinwrinkle and Leslie Van Houten and all that because I wanted to, and I read, you know, uh, Vincent Bugliosi's book, Helter Sculpture, because I wanted to better understand what John was trying to do to me and to do to this family that he wanted to start. But um, he basically just said that um, he gave me, like, the, the requirements for the, the group. And, and not that I ever did anything about it, so um, because if I did, I would have been arrested. But, um, I mean, I definitely considered it at the time because I was just, you know, in a dark spot and I just wanted to make him happy. But he was in a different state. So, you were in California and he was in a different state and he was he was encouraging you to, to lure or groom little girls? Yes. And how was he telling you to go about doing this? Um, just like sizing them up on the street and then like some, or like getting people like famous kids that I knew, um, uh, to, to just 
kind of persuade them to like be friends with him and then it would turn into this, you know, creepy cult. But you know, at the time he never used the word cult. He just said family, but what it was was a cult. So and the other thing is is I still get people his minions still try to talk to me to this day. There's one that's completely obsessed with me. Giovanni Mattis. He's autistic and he lives in Florida and um I already blocked him on Facebook and then he found my other Facebook and sent me messages on that but uh and like SD Rhodes all these people there his minions that you know have housed him and fed him and given him money they they're all you know completely you know obsessed with me to this day and uh so yeah there's that well a couple questions because you said before that you were sending him $300 box of chocolate so he was asking you for money or you were volunteering to give him money I was volunteering. You don't feel you were manipulated by the way you were giving him money? I do, but I, at the time, it was offering. But um, he didn't ask for Godiva chocolates all the time. But I, you know, I did send him expensive gifts. So, what other kind of gifts? Um, mostly it was just chocolate because he loves chocolate and sweets. But uh, and you know, uh, but. You know, cards and letters and whatnot. Okay. The thing I miss about Wex's dad, <laughs> this is a little tangential, but the thing I miss about his uh, dad was, I mean, if you called Wex's house, I mean, if you said anything, he was so weird and old that he would just start opening his mouth and saying anything about John. So journalists would call Wex and he would start running off his mouth and, and, and so it it very much upset John that his dad would talk about him to anybody. His dad is dead now or his dad is still alive? Yeah, his dad died, I think, like a year and a half or two years ago. I just found out about that, like, uh, last summer when Vice was going to do an article on me. Right. Now, um, uh, when he was telling you to groom these little kids, were these kids your age or, ki- or younger kids? Younger kids. What age? Would- I mean, I even considered my niece. My my biological niece, uh, uh, but nothing came of it. But um, because I got sent away, but luckily because I don't want to be you know in prison right now. But um, he he just said you know he kind of blessed it up to me. He's like you know just kind of you know this is what I want, but you you go about it the way you feel the need you the way you feel you need to. And and what was the plan? You would. Take these kids to your place or well, send them to him? Well, they would be called the Immaculates. What? Like, what was the plan? You would take these kids back to your place or send them to him? He would come pick no, them up? No, like, we would, like, we, like, they would be people that I knew. Like, like the kids, the people that I knew. Because right. I wasn't going to, like, kidnap children. But, like, you know, and just be like, oh, like, this is your, you know, you just call him, you know, Uncle John. And, you know, and then, you know, become close with him and all that. So, um at least in my mind, that's how it would have gone down. I don't know what he had in mind. He, you know, I think he was careful not to be too explicit and and direct me to do what he wanted. But I mean, he, there's proof, you know, if you look online, there's proof, you know, uh, screenshots and whatnot of him telling me to, you know, acquire children for this child sex cult and all that. So, and he just said we wanted to be a family that, uh, of, of people that loved one another. Now, if during the Which time that way when I was seventeen it didn't seem like a bad idea, right. and I was a kid myself. Granted, not as young, but you know. And plus, you had all so, these kind of confused. Uh, if you're dating men forty five years old and stuff, all these kind of confused the uh, boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and, and I'm I think so, I've, yeah. I'll say this. I think people who don't understand mental illness or brainwashing and cults gave me a very hard time when this news came out because this wasn't even supposed to be like in the news this was just because a journalist found out about it but um i think that i mean people sent me death threats um i remember uh like when i was in fashion school they some people said on the sf weekly article they're like oh i know this girl like i would never teach her if i if i ever saw her again like they people said they'd refuse to teach me and people said that like, they read some of the articles in class instead of learning. Like, that, I just thought that was so insane. And people, they, they posted all my 
my my addresses and my phone numbers on on the article, and I had to call SF Weekly and and the journalist Ashley Harold to take that down. I could have sued them for that. They they posted your phone number. But they did. They posted my address, my phone number, um, all that stuff. I mean, it was very dangerous. And people said that they if they saw me on the street, they'd beat me up. I mean, here's the thing: is I was a victim too of John. I was, you know, a young girl. I, I got involved with him at a very young age, and then we reconnected when I was 16. And uh, people just, like, wanted... I think they like to hide behind the anonymity of the Internet, but people were very mean. And, uh, you know, now I lead a normal life, and, you know, I I have someone very special to me um, in my life, uh, and uh, I'm just trying to, you know, move on from what John did to me, but... You know, I was as much of a victim as anybody else was with him. So I think people are very unfair. But, you know, I have my friends. You know, I lost a lot of friends. My parents lost lots of friends. All this news came out. But I think the people that have stuck by me, they know that I'm not that person. I was just in a very dark place in a cult. And the amazing thing, I think this is amazing. Like, my friends tell me this all the time. They're like, Sam, you're amazing. Like, look, how many people actually survive cults and abusive relationships? Not many people do. So the fact that you got help and your parents sent you away and then you, you started doing more therapy when you got back from rehab in Montana is amazing because so many people don't m- make it out alive. So I'm, I view myself as a survivor because John was very abusive. John, John was awful. When I look back on it, it was, it was bad. Yeah, very controlling, right? Yes, very controlling. I mean, he wanted to have a say in what I could do, who I could sleep with, who I could talk to. Um, and when he, he would get drunk a lot on the uh, 40s, and uh, he would just, and he was such a whiny, whiny bitch when he got drunk, but he would just bemoan the world and, and talk about how everyone treated him so badly. And oh, poor guy. All that. <laughs> that, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, God. Now, you said, where is he right now? In Thailand or something? Well, what I heard is that with one of his pedophile friends, he's in Australia working in marketing. And also, I found out from the Vice journalist um, that he is now, um, and if you look at his Facebook, you'll find all this information, but um, he is now, he claims that he's, fully gone through the, the gender reassignment. Yeah. So he's now fully a woman, but he's now like claiming that uh, he's fighting for laws to be passed for pedophiles to be chemically castrated. And he claims he's not like he turned on by children anymore, but I think once a pedophile, always a pedophile. Yeah. No, unless so. he's gone through some kind of treatment or some kind of conversion, you know? Now, now, he was just yeah. on, he was interviewed by Steph Watts, uh, just did a segment with him. We, he tracked him down in some foreign country, and he wasn't dressed as a woman. He he looked like a man. He had that thinning, bald, you know, hair, <laughs> you know, with that all, like he was <laughs> hair, hair teased up, like it was hair dry, you know, dried it for like an hour, you know, with, with the, the hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> all the little gaps. You can imagine the guy staring in the mirror for hours trying to get every strand of hair to cover the bald spot, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, you know what? I- forgot about was when um i think inside i went to robin sex's house in la she flew me down and uh we did inside edition and then we did uh um the one with uh uh what's his name anyways um but uh uh they someone when i was in la someone was traveling in france and took a picture of him they spotted him at the airport dressed as a woman Hmm. (laughs) they posted it online i just this he's so oh and when when the sheriff served him with my restraining order, he was dressed as a woman in a turtleneck. <laughs> so n- now, do you think he's he- obviously very confused? Oh yeah. Now, did, did he ever actually confess to you to a- actually having physically molested any children? Yes. And and what were the circumstances that he confessed to you about? What do you mean the circumstances? Yeah. Did he describe the names of the kids, where they lived, how he how he did it? What makes me so that was that when I got back from rehab, so we used, he he was the the person that told me to use hush mail because it was untraceable, and uh, so we used hush mail, Gmail, Yahoo, and the, my Hotmail account had all the names of the 
the kids that he molested. And my mom, when we got back before any of this stuff went down, she she just said, let's um, let's go and delete all these emails. And so I don't have them anymore. But there, I think there's some names I could recall if I thought hard enough. Like um, there was one, uh, Marie, uh, a French girl. There was, um, yeah, I don't remember their full names, but a lot of them were French. And no one's ever come to you like the FBI and asked you for these names or, or other investigators? We no, talked about, no. They just let him get away with it. He should be in in prison and for some reason he's not i just don't get it he is like he's like teflon for police i i don't get it yeah right because he's a pretty high profile guy and he, you say he has a bunch of minions there's people right now he has fans that are following him and, and interacting with him right now yeah and contacting me how many people do you think are following him right now uh well robin my old attorney she said about 50, but I would say I, that might be a bit high of an estimate. I would say it would be um, around 15 or 20, but who knows? No, I mean, the, I, there, there are some, some crazy people out there that, you know, will follow him. So it might be more. I don't know. But there's at least 15, 20 people that are followers of his, that, that are also advocate the same kind of activity that he's talking about. They're pedophiles. They have an interest in children. Yes. Okay. I mean, obviously, if they support him, they, they, it's like if, you know, if you associate with rapists and, you know, uh, rapists and uh, racist people and all that, you kind of are who you hang out with. So, I mean, if, you know, these people, you know, like, uh, what were their names? There was um, a guy in Pennsylvania. Um, oh, they called him, he had a nickname, like, Squidgy or, no, I forget what it was, but, um, and a, a a woman in a Beth Hope or something. I can't re really remember, but I mean, if they associate with him and they house him and help him out, I mean, they're just enabling, you know, a pedophile and two time murder suspect. So. And these people they, are stalking are you as well. They, they, they stalk you and harass you as well. Yeah. Still to this day. Yep. And what is their main complaint? I mean, with you? I've tried moving on from John, but I, I just can't really escape it. It's, I kind of figured it's kind of like herpes or something, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. Right. And what is their complaint with you, though? That just that you, you no longer interact with John? Well, some of, some of them are very, like, like Jeremy Mattis is obsessed with me in, like, a sexual way, but he's also physically attracted to John. And, and I can show you this. I'll send you all the stuff that yeah. I have. But, um... The other one's um, S.B. Rose, Shannon Douglas. She, I remember a few years ago, she asked me to be her date to her like 20th high school reunion. I'm like, yeah, no, I'll pass up on that. <laughs> but um, she lives in Van Nuys, I think. Um, and uh, she's, you know, she named one of her kids Jean something, like after Jean Benet Ramsey. Really? J O N something. Yeah, she's, she's a kook. What caused you to get a restraining order from, from Carr? The fact that he was watching my every move, stalking me online, and uh, threatening to kill me, like in very graphic detail. And how would, by email or telephone? How was he threatening you? Uh, telephone, email, text. Um, we did some video chats, and he was very paranoid about that. But did, you saw that on if you look up uh, John Mark Carson Beagle, you'll find a screenshot of us on Skype. He didn't know. I took that. Okay, you took a screenshot. Very okay. Now, but you were getting along good, and then suddenly one day you said, okay, John, I don't want any having any contact with you anymore. Is that what happened? Well, one time I remember I was, um, I was coming home from fashion illustration class, and I was carrying, you know, just a ton of art supplies, and, and, uh, I was on the on a bus coming from you know the one of the uh, like Fisherman's Wharf and uh, he's like there's no bus that comes from Fisherman's Wharf to your house and I'm like yes there is you just haven't been here for a long time um, and he's like get he's like, you know I'm on the bus and he's screaming at me on the phone he's like get home right now get home right now and get online we're gonna FaceTime or not we didn't have FaceTime back then we're gonna Skype or Yahoo Messenger it was and. Uh, I'm like, John, I, I will once I get home, but I ha you have to let me get home first. And then he just started getting paranoid and just 
for like the next like few months was just saying, you know, if you cost me my little girls, I'm going to hunt you down and kill you and laugh as you die. Things like that. And tell me that, you know, he'd like cut my throat open and, you know, hang me like a pig. Really? Yeah. So you, you went to court and they gave you the restraining order right away? No. Um, well, Ray found me, she found me first this lawyer that deals with pedophiles and I had, we kind of mutually fired each other because I didn't like his tactic. I, so I had him for like maybe two weeks and then he just started sending these like really like angry emails to John and I'm like, I want to think that's how you're supposed to do it. So we kind of fired each other. Um, his name was, An- was Anthony Zanante. And um, then Ray found Robin Sachs for me. And so Robin Sachs and I started talking. She came up to San Francisco for each of the hearings. So we got three temporary restraining orders. And then the fourth one was permanent. And But permanent means like three years. But yeah, so um, it, took, it took three times before I got the permanent one. Now, has he tried to contact you since the restraining order was in effect? Um, let me think about that. No, not that I'm aware. Well, there was one time when I went to my lover's concert and I came back home and my computer was not where I ever put it. And it was opened up to like a page. I don't even remember what the web page was. Something weird. And my bathtub was filled up with warm water and like everything was like moved into a different place. And I was just like, that has to be John. I, I couldn't think of anyone else that would want to do this to me. And I called the police. There was also, um, there was a time, this could be anyone, but you know, you never know. Um, I came home from my dad's funeral, August 9th, 2012. And, uh, I went into my bedroom and at the time I didn't have any blinds in here yet. Cause I just moved in, uh, earlier in 2012. And someone called me and I picked up and they knew exactly what I was wearing. They were watching me in my bedroom and uh, they knew what color shirt I was wearing. They knew or, uh, or the, the color dress I was wearing. They knew what I was doing. And so I called the cops and like nothing came of it. They did a search around the neighborhood. But, you know, there are times where I think like John is like watching me, even though he hates me. But I don't know. I don't know. I think he's in Australia right now, but his pedophile friend but uh yeah i don't know he's never like texted me or anything but you know i told you i tried to make amends with him and he just completely blocked me so he still doesn't like me he's just you know he's a very vengeful person and he holds grudges yeah now there's a there's a lot of Go ahead. The guy that outed him, michael tracy i became involved with him and i think he's in san francisco right now he's supposed to see me but and let me tell you this, that I'll tell you, this whole John Mark Carr case was so incestuous, like everything was so incestuous. So I got involved with people that knew John and had worked with him. The other person I got involved with was Dr. from Fox News. Oh, really? Four and a half. Yeah, very abusive. But yeah, no, so it's just all very weird. Everyone kind of, you know, got involved with each other. And so, yeah, that was. Another thing, I I had to go through lots of therapy to get away from Kilo, and he was married. He is married, and he has two kids. Okay, how old were you when you were yeah. dating? That was uh, nineteen to nineteen to twenty nine. Or twenty three. From, from from the age of nineteen to twenty three, you were dating. Yeah, well, illicit, you know, affair. Yeah, but is is this and in he the? Kept saying the I, what? Has this been in the press before? Uh, Vice wanted to cover it, but then uh, they they didn't run with either of the stories. Okay, no one's talked about it. Okay, I have I have such stuff on. <laughs> okay, we have to cover that one, Ed. We got to talk. <laughs> we got to talk for sure. <laughs> now, uh, very interesting. Uh, it's kind of spoiling this show, though. Well, look. Uh, <laughs> Um, and the other well, one is who? Mike, uh, Michael Tracy? Michael Tracy? You dated who is he? I didn't date him, but like we we flirted and sent pictures to each other, and you know he's. I think he's afraid to meet me, but he said he was going to be here in July and he was going to come. He wanted to stay with me, and I'm like, I just kind of can't do that, but I'll, I'm happy to meet you. We were supposed to meet in 2010, but uh, I think well he was going through a divorce and all that, but you know. 
But uh, no, he's in love with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Very, is he married too? Is he? Uh, he's divorced. He's divorced. Now. Okay. Uh, let me ask a question now. After this, you know, with this and being involved though, with other serial killers, is, is that true or not? That's true. Okay. Well, not anymore, but it was true. Well, which ones? What were you doing? Uh, Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker. Richard all names who, granted, is not a serial killer, but he killed a child and raped her. Right. Um, Helzer Brothers, and one's dead now. But, you know, the Helzer Brothers, they were at San Qu- I met them through uh, Richard Allen Davis. And then um, the Manson family, Tex Watson, who's part of the Manson family, but he's up in Oregon. Um, a bunch of others, I can't remember. There were some lesser-known ones, but never Scott Peterson. I fucking hate that guy. Right. Now, Richard Allen Davis, what did he have to say about the, the murder of Polly Class? Well, I remember he called me on the the 20th anniversary of the murder. And I remember Mark Class, who was actually friends with my lawyer, and I used to be friends with him on Facebook, but um, he was like, he's like, you know, they got the TV going, and they have this party going on at the Fairmont Hotel or something, or the Palace Hotel, you know, for the 20th, not a party, but like a memorial thing, and it's all over the news, and he was, he just sounded like bothered by it. He never said, I never, um, I never asked him about it, because I felt like it was not something he wanted to talk about and he has a temper but um i just remember the way he talked about you know mark talking on tv about you know this his daughter that you know this guy murdered and raped and uh, he just sounded like really annoyed and kind of like you know what's the big deal and so i thought that was kind of interesting and i there's a picture of me um the first time i ever went to go visit richard allen davis um, they had a new CEO that didn't know really how to do his job. And so Richard, Rick, not Richard, I always call him Rick, but um, Rick was like, can we get a picture of us kissing? And he's like, sure. And so I had a picture of me kissing Richard Allen Davis. But I used to visit him all the time. And then uh, he sent me all of his personal belongings because he was afraid the CEOs were going to steal it. So I have all of his personal belongings. He had a whole shrine up in his cell of pictures of me. What can I say? The crazy ones just love me. <laughs> now, okay. Now, Richard Allen Davis, did you ever suspect that he had uh, uh, accomplices in, in his murder of class? No. You're absolutely sure of that? No, but I, I always suspected that John had, John John definitely had uh, people helping him out. You know, with, you know the, the, the dark web online and all these forums for pedophiles and stuff. Right. He definitely had help. But Richard Allen Davis, he was, that was solo, but I mean, there is questions about. There are questions about whether he was the one that you know his uh, when he was eighteen, his girlfriend um, shot herself, but they suspected him of killing her, but he was never arrested for it and uh, never charged. But I was always curious about that too, because you know, it's not like you. How old was he when he killed Polly Cost? He was like. 34 i think right. um you don't just like start doing that when you're 34 you like build up to that i mean i studied forensic psychology you build up to that and so it makes sense with his long i mean he's the whole reason that there's the three strikes law um you know and just his long record so i just you know maybe he did you know somehow kill his girlfriend when he was 18 I wonder about that. But he never confessed it to you. Oh, I've got I've got some recordings of him singing happy birthday to me in a creepy voice. And also, there was one time he called me on my birthday, November 7th, and he told me that he was going to climb through my window and have sex with me. And that he was watching me. I'm like, that's a little too similar to Polly Glass. <laughs> yeah. So weird. I'm trying to find that voice message right now because I think it would be not, not worth something monetarily, but... But, uh, you know, it might be interesting for people to hear. It's a little disturbing, but, you know, I was disturbed by it. But, yeah, he was like, you know, I'm watching you through your window, you know, with his husky was. And, and then I break your window, and then I come in and and, and you and all that stuff. So, I don't know. He's he's an odd guy. He, apparently, he's not very popular um, at St. Quentin, but, you know, I got along with him. But, you know, I don't talk to him anymore. I haven't talked to him since 2000. Like maybe like February 2014. Oh, are you still talking to any serial killers? 
Nope. And now I, I've spoken to other people that had a pen pal relationship with Ramirez, uh, and and talked to him on the phone. And what he yeah would, yeah, <laughs> and what he would want. He's a, he's, he was a funny dude. Okay, and what was he? What would he do with you on the phone? Well, kind of talk nonsense, but mostly what the thing that I thought was quirky and kind of funny about him was the drawings he'd sent me. <laughs> I still have those too. He would send me like, like a dinosaur eating a person, and I'm just like, cool. Like I don't know what this means, but you know. And um, I think uh, at the time he was having some marital issues with Dorian Loy Ramirez, right. who I always thought was just you know. I was never you know I never thought that that John was innocent. I never thought Rick was innocent or Richard Ramirez. I never, I never condoned anything they ever did. Um, I wasn't stupid. I just was in a dark place. But like, I re- remember watching YouTube videos of Dorian Loy Ramirez um, when she got married at St. Quentin in her, you know, frumpy white dress saying, my husband is innocent of all charges. You know, it's like, no, he confessed to doing it and he got caught. And uh, so I'm not, you know, like blinded, you know, I see them for what they are. It's just I'm very fascinated by the criminal brain. Now, when he would talk to you on the phone, did he ask you to describe the room, the room you were in? He did. Why do you ask that? No, because the other person I talked to said that he would say, what's on your refrigerator? What's on, you know, and, and you describe yeah. every little detail of the room. He now, would do that, yeah. Right. Now, I heard someone who heard that show, and they contacted me, and they said what he was doing was he was astral projecting himself into the room. Now, did you have oh. any, yeah, I know. Did you ever have any kind of an indication that might be going on? I don't know, but I mean, I got his name tattooed on my body. Do you really? I, I'm getting it removed. I'm halfway through, and I also have a I have a personalized love letter from Richard Ramirez tattooed on my ribs that I'm getting removed too. <laughs> that is some dumb shit when I was young, didn't I? Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Now. But now, what were you into Satanism as well? No, but I mean, I've read about Anton Lavey and right. Lavey and uh, Satanism, but yeah, no, not really. Okay, very interesting. Uh, now, publicly, no one knows about you and. Nope. Did you have to get a restraining well, order? Well, my lawyer does. So did Ray, but um. We're still friends on Facebook. Um, I just troll him and laugh at all his, like, really outright stuff. But yeah. um, I blocked him in January on my phone because he's just, he is, he was even worse than John. Can I tell you that? He was worse than John. He, oh, and I, yeah, I got a general piercing because of him. He um, wanted to relive his uh, Frank Clevenger book series and um, kind of weird. He also is a self loathing Jew that like is somehow Christian now and um here's the thing is he's very smart but like in you know, he went to Johns Hopkins and uh Tufts, but like he doesn't use he's he um he says that San Francisco is an abomination because it's a gay capital and because we have trans people and um he says that um you know, uh he just says a lot of weird shit and he was just um he wanted to pull me around by my genital piercing on a chain and like rip it out or like, like go to a restaurant, have me drink a gallon of water and then force me. It'd be, oh yeah. Um, I have a tattoo for behind my ear and one on my foot that he told me to get that says lost and found and slave tattooed on my wrist. Cause he was my master and I was his slave. And do you have it? You have uh, screenshots of all this? Oh Yeah. Oh, okay. honey, I'll give it all to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to talk. Let me ask you a question now. Uh, yeah. Out of all this, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground here, uh, but but mostly sticking with um, uh, Mark Carr, uh, is there anything I've forgotten to ask you that's important you think the audience needs to know about? Um. Well, um, this isn't, like, terribly important, but before um, the, before all this came out in the news and before I did anything t- against him legally – I was up in on Bainbridge Island visiting a friend from rehab shortly after I got out. And Bainbridge Island is about, it's a short ferry ride from Seattle. So my friend and I would go to Seattle, and John texts me or emails me. He's like, go to the closest newsstand and get the, the National Enquirer. So I get it, and there's a story about him. Well, he was very suspicious of why I was, I was 
staying on Baby's Island with my friends because John Ramsey is uh, the innocent. The the foundation he has for um, after the Trump and a Ramsey murder. Uh, that is the phone number is based on Baby's Island. I don't know if the actual foundation is based on Baby's Island, but the phone number is. So he thought I was in cahoots with John Ramsey, and he became paranoid. And uh, and I remember thinking he knew Seattle so well. He's like, oh, he's like, I think of you when I go to the dive at the mall near where I live. Um, and I'm like, where are you? And he wouldn't tell me. But I found out through um, Dano and uh, uh, who's the other guy that we both know. Um, that, yeah, Vito Colucci, that because um, they were my PIs with Robin Sachs, that he was. I was the closest I've been to him in the last, at that point in the last. Uh, 10 years now um, almost 20 years uh, what I was six blocks away from him when he was sending me these messages he was staying in a homeless woman shelter as a woman and uh, that was the closest I've been to him in person in almost 20 years now Vito Colucci and Dan O'Hanks were contacting you to locate uh, John Mark Carr. How, how were they able to find I him? I didn't really have anything to do with it. It was Robin and her team of okay. investigators. So, yeah. And who's Robin? My attorney, Robin Sack. She, she closed her private practice a few years ago, but she's a commentator on TV now. Okay. I actually started when I was in the hospital uh, a few months ago. I was like, go Robin. Go girl. Kill it. But uh, yeah, she's um, she's very supportive and we're still uh, friends. We talk from time to time, so she's great. Okay, and, and but you, now you have no longer any interest in contacting serial killers. I mean, I would if I just knew that I wouldn't like get so involved in it. <laughs> I mean, it's still interesting, you know, and they could be interesting to sell or something. But I'm kind of against selling that kind of stuff. I just think that's like exploitation. But I was just genuinely interested in like what they were like because I was studying forensic psychology and uh, uh, reading about the criminal mind in the books was not sufficient enough. So I just decided to write them. And I certainly got a, a look into their minds and what they were like when they weren't, you know, telling Mark Class that his daughter said, I just don't do me like my daddy did, you know, stuff like that. I wanted to see what they were like when, when no one was looking. Now, th- those things that uh, Richard Allen said uh, about Mark Class, uh, did uh, he ever repeat that to you, or did he admit to you that that nope. was all false? Nope. Never brought it up. Never, never once brought it up. What? Did you ever ask him? Yeah, I was kind of too afraid to. Um, yeah. I'm kind of too afraid to. You you were afraid to ask him, like even over the phone or in a letter. You were afraid to ask. Even in person, just kind of felt like it. Like since I wasn't, you know, there on an official, you know, um, position, I was just there as, you know, pen pal and as a friend. And you know, at one point I changed my name to Samantha Davis on Facebook years ago, but um, I thought about marrying him for some reason. Don't ask me why. I just had issues but um i think i was just like so afraid of just like losing something that i thought was good at the time which was my relationship with him and and i liked that i knew you know was you know friends with all these other you know crazy serial killers on death row and and uh stuff but i mean um i think the last time i sent Rick Davis money on JPay was maybe two years ago. I didn't talk to him, but I think he just put 50 bucks into his account because you know, he's not very popular there. And I think he has, he has nuns and priests come and give him art supplies. Oh, he's a very good artist, by the way. He, um, yeah, he, he sent me a bunch of drawings. He, uh, yeah, he's very talented, but, uh, you know, he's very stuff and he's in prison for a reason. So, you know, I kind of leave it at that. And with Richard Allen Davis, you think the only murder was Polly Class, but there was, you suspect, his girlfriend who died at 18, you suspect, but any other besides those? Yeah, I suspect that he might have killed her, but who knows, because, um, I mean, have you looked at his his arrest record? It is so long. It's one of the longest ones I've seen. Okay. And no, I, I've never seen his arrest record, no. Check it out. 
Okay, great. And all these recordings you have and stuff like that, you're going to send me all this stuff? Yes. Okay, great. All right. And, <laughs> <laughs> this is Sorry, great. I get your email when we're off the phone. No, I will. I will in a second. Okay, I guess that's. I guess we covered pretty much everything, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, and we'll be right back after more of this.